Uh, <laughs> our next speaker is uh, Cody Hinban. Uh, he's going to talk about convolution uh, fast Fourier transform for option pricing in the Heston model. Uh, can you hear me? Does this work? Thank you. Okay, so thank you. It's Cody Hindman, not Hindman, but it's fine. Uh, everyone makes the same mistake. So this is um, something that is related to Peter's work. And I'll just say, I first met Peter, I think in 2006 at a party for Dilip Madan's 60th uh, birthday conference. And we were discussing um, I don't know what, and then it came up that he was Canadian, which for any Canadian, it's a, we always like to know who's Canadian. And uh, so we chatted about that a bit. And then the last time I saw him would have been in Toronto at the uh, Siam meeting in 2019. And he was always very generous and always liked to come to Canada, to Toronto to visit. So the other thing I'll mention is my Co-author here is my former PhD student, Shang Gao, who actually went here, uh, the master's program before it was Tandon though. So I guess before Peter was here. Uh, so this is on convolute, what I call convolution FFT. And we restrict ourselves to the Heston model. Um, the convolution FFT really builds a lot or was inspired a lot by the Carr and Medan paper that introduced FFT to option pricing. And, you know, we are going to give a uh, analytic formula, I guess, for the joint characteristic function in the Heston model. Uh, Jim Gathrell has an expression in his book uh, so maybe I'm bringing Coles to Newcastle here for this, but uh, <clears throat> the thing is we do some kind of boundary error control to improve our estimates and we use these convolution ideas. So I'll just review quickly um, the Carr and Medan 99 paper in case anybody isn't aware, but I'm sure everyone is. So we have the log of the stock price XT, and we can write the characteristic transform of X capital T. Um, there, this is kind of model free at the moment. And if you have constant interest rates, no dividends, you can write the price of this European call option as sort of a black shoals like formula where the delta and um, the other probability of ST going greater than K um, are given in terms of integrals of this characteristic function, all right? So if you take small K to be the log strike price, okay? And you have the risk neutral density of the log price, then by you can write the characteristic function just as this integral with respect to this density of uh, the exponential of this complex number. So then you get the price of the zero, the time zero price of this call option um, in terms of um, this density as well. And what you know they showed is that if you write it the CT as a function of K, and you look at its logarithm and you do some damping actually to make sure everything is integrable. And you calculate the Fourier transform of the C, the CT, okay. Um, then 
you can derive the expression for this Fourier transform in terms of the characteristic function. And then you can take the inverse Fourier transform and you know, recover the price for this call option. Okay, so obviously I'm skipping a lot of things, but then you can approximate this integral by discretization, all right? And then use the fast Fourier transform to efficiently calculate the sum. Now, they do a lot more that, than that in their paper and they look at uh, variance gamma as an example. Um, but after this, there was a flurry of activity, I would say. Um, everybody had sort of the original Heston model had, you know, a representation in terms of like integrals uh, that were to be evaluated numerically, but the FFT method kind of uh, made that a lot faster. Okay, so we're just going to consider the Heston model. So just to fix the notation, I'll, I'll put the Heston model up. And uh, under P, we can have uh, the Heston model written like this. And we're going to assume that the zero boundary is unattainable, even if that's not always a realistic assumption. All right. And then we'll take a market price of risk that maintains the same uh, structure of the Heston model after the measure change. All right. And so then under the risk neutral measure, we take the Heston, I cannot see red. Well, okay, I can see it, but when I'm sitting in the audience, I can't. So um, we get the risk neutral Heston dynamics. Okay. So then if we take the log, and consider the joint process X with the log, log price and the, the variance, okay? Then we can write this in kind of vector notation. So if we look at the pricing formula, all right, we can decompose it into a similar kind of formula where we're taking the expectations of these indicator functions under two different measures. And we have the forward price and we're taking this equivalent Martingale measure S, okay, with forward as a numeraire. And then um, we have these probabilities P1 and P2 and a Black-Scholes-like formula, right? So none of this is new and exciting, but that's fine. So the characteristic function, as I said, from Heston can be written in different ways. There's this paper, the little Heston trap, it's called by Albrecher et al, where they discuss about, because of the square root of a complex number, you have these two different representations. And then there's many discussions about branch points and rotations and all sort of things to look at the numerical kind of issues related to using one or the other of the uh, characteristic function representations. But we're gonna look at this joint characteristic function initially. So it's defined in equation seven and we can get an expression for the joint characteristic function. This may have appeared in the literature somewhere um, and Somebody can tell me if it has, but I couldn't find it. Of course, everyone uses a different parameterization, so it's always hard to go through and reconcile notation and check every single paper that anything has ever appeared in. So we have this joint characteristic function, uh, and then we use a kernel where um, you know we, we're basically taking the increment of the X and we get this simplified expression. And you can show that this is differentiable in P and Q. Uh, so it's continuous also. So this is something that's useful. So just to compare the way we look at um, the characteristic function. So if you take Heston's original formulation, uh, you can see 
that it has some kind of discontinuities or at least some kind of <clears throat> shapes that will cause um, numerical issues if you go to implement even just straight numerical integration to get the probabilities. And if you compare it to ours, our formulation for the joint characteristic function, it's slightly smoother, okay? And, well, not slightly, it's smooth. And, uh, you know, looks a little bit easier to handle, okay? So that's kind of review of Carr and Medan, and then the Heston model. Um, but now I want to talk about the convolution method. So the convolution method is basically related to something I did with another student on for numerical solutions of BSDs, where you can write certain expectations in terms of obviously integrals with respect to the density. And if the, if you have, uh, that it can be written in terms of the increment, the conditional density, then you can apply convolution, the convolution uh, after you take the Fourier transform, you just have the, the Fourier transform of some function with convoluted with the density, okay? And then um, because of the convolution property, you can turn that into a product and then it becomes just the uh, Fourier transform of the density, which is the characteristic function and then you take the inverse, you do some operations, you take the inverse transform and you recover what you need to recover to calculate the expectation. Okay, so it's just a little bit of Fourier analysis. And so this works with uh, affine models and obviously Brownian motion and BSDs, but in the Heston model, you may say, well, does it work here? Well, if you look at the small time kind of uh, density of xt, just this is just the density of the log stock, I guess, um, conditional on x and v, then Dragulescu and Yakovenko uh, showed that this looks like a Gaussian. Okay, so then you can have this kind of property of the density that you need in order to um, use convolution. Okay, so as I said, let's say we want to calculate the Fourier transform of one of these probabilities. Okay, and so we write it in terms of the integral inside, inside the Fourier transform here. All right, this is the integral of the delta function uh, against the conditional density, which can be written as instead of y given x, it's just y minus x. Okay, so this is a convolution. Then we apply the convolution property to just change the Fourier transform of the product into the product of the Fourier transforms. Okay, and we have the Fourier transform of the density. Okay, is just going to be given in terms of um this kernel okay related to the characteristic function and then we can simplify our expression to find this probability by then taking the inverse Fourier transform of all of this okay so equation 16 on the right hand side this is all Fourier transforms we have to discretize it uh eventually but Okay, we can write a formula for the call option price, uh, which looks a bit nasty, but it's all right. Uh, these are just the probabilities, okay? And then we discretize the uh, spatial variable and the frequency space, okay? In a way, satisfying the Nyquist uh, constraint so that we don't have aliasing. Uh, and then we can write things in terms of discretize or discrete Fourier transform in order to, um, you know, approximate. So there's some truncation involved, but we can then use the FFT to calculate 
this discrete Fourier transform very quickly. Okay, so this is giving us the pricing formula and we call this scheme one. Now the scheme two is a little bit more related to the car and Maden, but we do it on log price instead of log strike. And we, if you're familiar with that paper, okay, it's, it's kind of similar notation, right? Where you have the payoff in terms of, you know, the log strike here, and you can recover this call option uh, price by taking the inverse Fourier transform. And you have to undamp it because the call price is not at L1, but uh, you, can, you can make that work, okay? So you can implement it as well by getting a discretization or you know, representing this in terms of this discrete Fourier transforms and then implement with the fast Fourier transform. Okay, but obviously there's a lot of technical kind of stuff, uh, which obviously we'll skip. Okay, but there's two sources of error here. You have truncation error for discrete, like truncating the sampling region. And then you have discretization error associated with the sampling frequency. So if we let the error um, between the true probability and the approximation be this EI, using I for an index when you're dealing with complex numbers and a lot of stuff is generally a bad idea, but uh, we've done it here, sorry. Uh, so then you can figure out the error for the convolution FFT scheme one, all right, uh, in terms of the errors for these probabilities, okay? And you can show that both of them have error of order, you know, the term representing um, the truncation, okay, is kind of exponential. And then this term is order n to the minus m, where m depends on the kind of weightings that you're using to implement the FFT, a trapezoidal rule or something, but m is greater than two. So let me check the time. So the discretization error is at least order two, which is the same as uh, one of Lord's earlier results. And the truncation error is negative exponential to the frequency. And you can see that if you look at 19, the error X is going to increase, or the error is going to increase with the strike price, okay? When you approach the boundary. So we introduced some boundary control schemes just to improve this error. And just if you have any kind of target function F, okay? Then we put the dampening parameter in and then we want to shift the target function to map it from a non-periodic kind of signal to a periodic one, um, which improves the performance of the FFT. And you can do this by choosing an appropriate function H that is equal at the boundaries and smoothly connected with, so that the derivatives also match at the boundaries. Okay, so, uh, imposing these two conditions, picking a function H, we have kind of two options, uh, a linear function H or this kind of exponential function H. You can solve for the A and the B uh, that give you the properties that you want, okay? And then you can recover. I mean, you go and you apply this convolution FFT to the, um, or the FFT to the, to the quantities you have on these shifted and damped functions, but then you can recover the probabilities you need by reversing the shifting scheme and the dampening scheme. Okay, so I'll just use my last couple minutes here, or a few minutes to talk about some numerical implementation results, um, which, we compare to, in some cases, um, the integral method. So this is the original approach of 
test in where we use some numerical integration methods, or we compare it to Carr and Medan's FFT method that we implemented. Uh, so maybe not the best implementation, but um, <clears throat> the kind of standard one. All right. And we'll estimate these probabilities for the Heston model. And uh, we can look at the effects of different boundary control schemes, uh, boundary error control schemes, and uh, look at the performance. So the one thing I'd like to notice that if you do FFT on the original function, you get these problems, numerical kind of problems at the boundaries where this is the, you know, log moneyness, I guess. Um, but, you know, this should be on the left boundary going to zero and on the right boundary going uh, to one. Okay. So if you don't modify the function, you don't do the shifting, uh, you get problems at the boundaries. And if you do do the shifting, uh, it looks like what it should look like for both probabilities. Okay. So these are you know, probabilities uh, of the moneyness being greater than whatever. All right. And then if you look at the error of the FFT, convolution FFT uh, against um, the numerical kind of method, um compared to all right so then you have fft is just the car and medan fft it's this straight line okay and then our result is the kind of hump thing so you see at the money there's something going on here obviously uh and since most people care about at the money maybe that's a reason to use the car and medan formulation all right but we could improve this if we <clears throat> spent a lot of time on it. And similarly for the second method, um, you have this similar kind of formulation. So the at the money errors are the highest and maybe that's one place where it's not competitive, but uh, as I said, you could try to control for that. And then we compare different kind of discretizations or sampling frequencies to look at the performance. Obviously when you increase by a factor of you know, two, the error goes down, but not that much to make it worth it necessarily. And then if you look at what happens when you don't do the shifting, uh, you have uh, you know, certain kind of errors versus when you, uh, or sorry, when you don't do the dampening or the shifting, then when you do the dampening, but not the shifting, and then when you do dampening and shifting, Okay, you get uh, different kind of errors. And we look at our kind of performance compared to the Car and Medan FFT, um, which, you know, in some cases for large sampling uh, is sort of double or half the speed rather. Okay, our method. And, you know, the accuracy is probably good enough, but if it's not, somebody can tell me. So this is just a simple kind of method that um, was inspired a lot, or our earlier work was inspired a lot by uh, Carr and Medan formula. And uh, so then this method built on that in some sense. And if you want to look at some details, you can look at uh, Shang's PhD thesis on our archive at Concordia, or wait until I get the paper up. And there's some references uh, here, but uh, thank you very much. And thanks to the organizers for letting me speak. Thank you.
just have a practical question. You showed the errors, but um, what I'd like to know is um, how many options can you calculate, for example, per second? Okay. In other words, what's the speed of the convolution method? Thanks. Well, it's actually, we didn't go too much into that, but we have some intuition that this would be able to calibrate like the whole smile like simultaneously because of the way we formulate it. Um, so for each option, it's half the speed of car and Medan. Um, so, you know, these are in milliseconds. So you could do the whole volatility surface in, you know, probably less than a minute or two and uh, on a laptop, okay, on whatever computers they use in industry, I don't know. And, uh, you know, maybe doubling, everybody wants to see kind of exponential increases in time, but, uh, you know, or they say, well, doubling is not good, I'll just get twice as many CPUs or GPUs. Okay, well, fine, but, implement this on your twice as many GPUs or CPUs and it's still twice as fast. So to answer your question, we didn't really try that. Maybe we should before we get the paper up and uh, provide some more kind of insight. Uh, this paper wasn't going to be the next one that I worked on, but because of Peter and the connections and the conference, I moved it up in the rotation a little bit, um, just to pay my respects. And uh, I think it's a nice little idea. So I hope that gives some insight to your question. Uh, hi, I mean, the Karen Madan, I suppose, is relatively unusual. It's a numerical method. Um, and according to Dilip, they knocked it up in an evening. Um, and it uses a fixed alpha. That's kind of the Achilles heel. Roger Lord's convolution, convolution paper has an optimal alpha. Yeah. And then subsequently, the COS method was kind of state of the art about 10 years ago. Um, the trouble is estimating L for difficult parameter choices. These days, the state of the art is Life Anderson and Mark Lake have a wonderful numerical integration scheme that is clever and remarkably robust and remarkably quick. Uh, and I've written about it and they've written about it in Wilmot magazine. Thanks, I'll have to look those, those references up. I appreciate that. Any questions from the virtual audience, if we can bring them up? Seems, seems not. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. <laughs>